550 KTRS. Happy New Year. I can still say Happy New New Year, at least for the rest of the week. It is the first week back and everyone's settling in. And we are inside of one month from the Iowa caucus. And then we're off and running with the New Hampshire primary, South Carolina. And then the political season really takes off. Our guest this hour is a man who really needs no introduction. He was an ambassador to the U.N. He was United States senator. He was attorney general for the great state of Missouri. Senator John Danforth, welcome back to Big 550 KTRS. Thanks, McGraw. Good to be with you. You betcha. Um, let's talk politics. And let's start with, um, in 2016, there is an argument, it seems to be going on in the Republican Party, between the quote-unquote establishment Republicans and the anti-establishment Republicans. When you hear that, what do you think? Well, it's puzzling to me. I, I spent an awful lot of time in Republican politics. I've been out of it now for more than two decades, but it is, it's not a concept that I'm really familiar with because back in the day, the Republican Party was a very, very broad party. We had people who were as conservative as Barry Goldwater or Strom Thurmond people who are as liberal as Jacob Javits, but we were able to work together as, as one party. And the notion of trying to uh, view some people in the party as not really Republican was, um, was not something that was current at that time. It seems like some of these debates, it's a debate or a more or less of a litmus test that there is a, you must be a certain way on every single thing. And if you deviate from that litmus test, there's something wrong with you within the party. This is, this is true, and this is the way it's going. And I think it's, it's true, it's certainly true for Republicans. I think it's true for Democrats as well. Uh, there is a lot of pressure from the so-called base of the party to be absolutely pure on issues, not 99% pure, but 100% pure, to be uncompromising, uh, to take hard positions and never budge from those hard positions. And um, that has become the nature of politics. And of course, if that is politics, politics really doesn't work because politics is messier than that. It's yeah, it, it, it depends on a degree of compromise to get anything done. But um, if both sides are taking the position, well, it's our way or the highway, then, in fact, nothing does get done, and that's been the current state of politics. When you were in the arena during the uh, Reagan administration, the Bush administration, it was pretty volatile, and it was pretty... Uh, you know, it, was, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't kids' play. It was, you know, pretty bad. What is it about today that makes Washington unworkable as opposed to when you were there where it was just the rough and tumble of politics? Well, you're right. Politics, as I say, it's not beanbag, and it, it, it's always been a contact sport, uh, always competitive, no doubt about that. But um, at that time, in order to do anything in Congress, and Congress is really sort of the action place, or should be the action place for the federal government, in order to do anything, you had to collect a majority of the votes. And that very often meant working across party lines. So, uh, for example, I was on the Senate Finance Committee, which was the tax writing committee of the Senate, and I don't remember a single instance in the 18 years that I was on the Senate Finance Committee that anybody was able to do anything on a purely party basis. It was always trying to cobble together a collection of Republicans and Democrats, usually in approximately even numbers, and uh, try to reach agreement and move on. It seems like the voters almost penalize you if you agree or come to some type of bipartisan compromise. They do, and there's a, there is a new verb in, in politics, which is to be primaried. And the threat is that if you, if you are in office, if you are in Congress, 
and you deviate from the, what they consider to be the appropriate line, then they are going to find a primary opponent to run against you in the next election. Most people in Congress want to avoid being in primary elections. So there is a lot of pressure to, uh, to be um, very, very rigid in, in taking positions. Senator Danforth, our guest, um, the, I just got back from the Reagan Library, and you forget, people invoke Reagan quite often these days, but I think people forget how positive he was. He, he was, he exuded positive, he, he talked, he never talked about his enemies in a negative way, and he, and he never talked about America in a negative way. He was always positive. I don't see our current crop of politicians being positive. They're using negativity the way Reagan used positivity. Well, first of all, he was happy. And that, that says a lot. I mean, Ronald Reagan was a happy person. He exuded happiness. He had a good sense of humor. He, because of his sense of humor, he could relate well to, for example, Tip O'Neill, who was the Democratic Speaker of the House. They could disagree on political things, but they could relate to each other. They could get along with each other. Mike Deaver, who was sort of Reagan's guy in the White House, wrote a book about Reagan, and he said the thing about Ronald Reagan is you want it to try to please him. And that, I think, was true. I mean, I was... I was in the Senate throughout the Reagan presidency. I didn't always agree with them, but I, I always, if I could, I wanted to work with them. I wanted to please him. And that says a lot. And I think that is missing today. And I think another thing that's missing that, that Ronald Reagan had is the sense of humor. I mean, I think that one of the things about today's politicians is that they, they all seem so grim and guarded, and maybe for good reason. Maybe they think that if they try to, to be humorous, people are going to pounce on it or you know, take it the wrong way. But for one reason or another, the humanity has been drained out of politics. Donald Trump's phrase, make America great again, connotes that America is no longer great. Where, where Ronald Reagan said, we're great, but our greatest days are still ahead of us. So it's, one's a negative point of view, the other one's a positive point of view. That is, that is exactly right. And it's, it's a window into two different kinds of personalities. Because um, what, what Trump says is that he is going to make America great again. And what Reagan said famously, I think it was his last speech on leaving the White House, is it wasn't the greatness of his ideas, but it was the American people. So he recognized what I think is clearly true, that we live in a great country, and it is great now. And it is great because it was designed in this brilliant way by the people who wrote our Constitution. And they created this system where all of these different interests and all of these different people could live together in one nation. And that, that is a great gift to a country and it does set us apart. Look at other parts of the world where people are killing each other because they think it's God's will that they kill each other. Well, in America, thank God, we, we, have, we have figured out how to live together as one country, and we have gloried in that. So we pledge allegiance to one nation indivisible, and our motto is e pluribus unum, out of many, we are one. That is, that is a really great gift. And I think that, I really think Trump has got it absolutely wrong because for Trump, 
it's, you know, we're all kind of going to hell in a handbasket and we need the great leader, namely Donald Trump, to ride in from the from the hinterland somewhere and and save the country. But the way he does it is to divide us and to get everybody mad at everybody else. It is the exact opposite approach of Ronald Reagan, and I think it's the opposite of what America's true greatness is. You have said, I've heard you say, that George Washington rejected that form of government. Well, this is true. I, you know, I've been thinking about Washington and and Washington, the, the difference between George Washington and Donald Trump, it's very, very interesting. Because at the end of the Revolutionary War, just as that war was, was almost over, and our government was functioning even worse than it functions now, that was the Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation and Congress that couldn't even pay for the war and couldn't even pay for the soldiers. And at the end of the war, some of the military officers said, let's keep our guns and let's take control of government and let's, let's enthrone a king. We, that's what we want. And Hamilton was talking this way. We, let's get ourselves a king and the obvious potential king was George Washington. And Washington, in what some people think was the most important political speech ever made in this country, met with the officers and said, in effect, absolutely not. We fought to create a republic, not a monarchy. And even though a republic is messy and complex and sometimes ineffective, that's going to be our system and we're not going to have this man on the white horse. And uh, it was a great gift of George Washington to America. And you say that true conservatism is not one man telling you what to do. That's the definition of conservatism, or one of them. I think it is the definition of, of conservatism because conservatives are very wary about the concentration of power and particularly the concentration of power in hands that the electorate cannot control. So we've created the system in America which is called Congress, checks and balances, and it's confusing and it's messy and it has all of these moving parts, and it is slow moving, but it allows all of these different interests, now in a country of over 300 million people, all of these different interests can exist together. Nobody gets his way all the time, nobody. But everybody is respected, everybody is heard, and that is the system that we have right now. And conservatives understand that. And conservatives believe that big policy decisions in our country should be made by their elected representatives in Congress. They should not be handed down from on high in the form of executive orders. They certainly should not be handed down from on high from the Supreme Court, from federal judges, people who, as they say, legislate from the bench. If we're going to have government policy affecting the American people, it should be worked out in a system where we all can put in our two cents, and that is called Congress. And what's happened now is that Congress has become weakened, and so we look more and more, as you know, with the the president's gun control position to executive orders rather than rather than the working of Congress. And the problem with Trump is this is Trump. I mean, Trump Trump's basic well his stated position 
is that everybody is is uh, a fool, you know, moron, stupid. All these people in Washington are stupid, and so he he would. I'm not sure he'd say it in quite these words, but his basic position is his basic position is I'm the great man. I know how to do it. I am the person on the white horse. I can ride in and save this all by myself. I can build a wall. I can make Mexican pay, Mexicans pay for it. I can do this. I can do that. And it is not the way America was set up by our founding fathers. And it is certainly not conservative to hope that one savior riding in from the outside is going to fix everything. That is Senator Danforth. We are just getting started more with the senator from the great state of Missouri. He was an ambassador to the U.N. as well as the attorney general uh, right here in St. Louis. Senator Danforth, more in a moment. Big 550 KTRS. This is McGraw Live on KPLR 11.2, stltoday.com, and the Big 550 KTRS. It's not.